Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Syngenta has provided funding for this program. Syngenta, committed to sustainable agriculture, committed to improving life. Ecolab is the global leader in cleaning, sanitizing, food safety, and infection control. Headquartered in St. Paul, we've been helping to make the world a cleaner, safer, healthier place for more than 80 years. Ag InfoLink, providing the food industry with traceability solutions to enhance business performance, ensure regulatory compliance, and improve food security. For more information, please visit aginfolink.com. It's dinner time, here, and here, and here, and at 965,000 restaurants across the United States, in 140 million homes. At roughly three times a day over a year, Americans consume 300 billion meals, one mouthful at a time. We spend half of our food budget at home and the other half in restaurants. In total, that's a one trillion dollar grocery bill. America's a big country with a big appetite. These statistics help us to understand the gargantuan task of bringing all that food from the farm to the fork. At cattle ranches and feedlots and meat processing plants, wheat fields and flour mills and bakeries, market gardens and vegetable packing houses, canneries, bottlers, soup makers and stew mixers, in every corner of the U.S., in Mexico, Canada, Europe, China, and Japan, and almost every country, countries we hardly know, we rely on people to provide us with food. All that extends to the rest of the food chain, to the supermarket and the restaurant kitchen. We expect all food through these many stages of growth, processing, and preparation to be wholesome and safe. Most of it is. Some of it is not. It affects every American and um, their children, their dogs, their cats, uh, uh, everything um, uh, that we care about uh, is related to food safety and it's right up at the top in terms of uh, safety issues. Sometimes the system breaks down, but given that we have this huge country and this huge world, it's really not that often that in the United States we get disease outbreaks from food. They make the headlines. 76 million Americans got sick from their food in the past year. Most of those food-borne illnesses last only a day or two, but 325,000 ended up in hospitals and 5,000 died. Experts say that is all preventable. We certainly are better off than we were a hundred years ago, but, but we're, we're hitting a, a cross point. And that is, as we become more global, it means that we're eating more foods that weren't prepared and, uh, and weren't canned or, or brought um, uh, from our own country. And we should not take any bows as long as one person is getting sick any place in this country. We do have points in place where we can ensure that food safety, but people have to abide by those laws. We have long understood how the organisms which make us sick are transmitted. Contaminated food once killed millions. In 1847, Dr. Ignat Semmelweis of Budapest discovered that the simple act of washing hands with hot water and soap could save lives. His contemporary, Louis Pasteur, found that the application of heat kills microorganisms. 
Now we pasteurize milk and orange juice and use heat to sterilize so many things, including all canned food. A look at recent recalls highlights the types of organisms that are risks to our food supply. The largest manufacturer of frozen hamburgers in the United States, Topps Meats of Elizabeth, New Jersey, went out of business in September 2007 when over 21 million pounds of its ground beef products were recalled from the marketplace. It's the second largest beef recall in history. U.S. Department of Agriculture inspectors said that E. coli had been found in samples of their product and that a number of people had become ill. Of concern to health authorities is a strain of E. coli known as O157H7. It exists in the intestines of healthy cattle, goats, and sheep. It's present on most cattle farms and gets into the meat supply during slaughter. E. coli causes diarrhea, vomiting, and stomach cramps, but it's a risk to the young and the elderly where it can cause kidney failure. When people are infected with E. coli, they can spread it from one person to another through poor hygiene. Contaminated meat looks and smells normal. The way to avoid foodborne E. coli is to ensure that meat is cooked properly. A large number of canned foods from Castleberry Products of San Diego, with a major cannery in Augusta, Georgia, were recalled across the U.S. and Canada in the summer of 2007 because of fears over botulism. Botulism is a risk when foods are not subjected to enough heat in the canning process. Reports say that millions of cans of chili, beef, pork and stews were involved. Fortunately, only four people were hospitalized. Botulism releases a toxin that can cause double or blurred vision, drooping eyelids, slurred speech, and muscle weakness and paralysis. In some, it can lead to death. Also in 2007, Oscar Mayer issued a warning over chicken breast strips that were grilled and sold as ready to eat. The concern was over contamination by a pathogen known as listeria. It causes fever, muscle aches, gastrointestinal illness, headaches, and loss of balance. The young, elderly, and unborn are at greatest risk. It can cause miscarriage or stillbirth. About 500 die in the U.S. each year due to listeria. It occurs in the soil and the water and can show up in unpasteurized or raw foods. It also thrives in processed foods like cheese and cold cuts if they are not stored or handled correctly. Pasteurization is one way to combat listeria. Peter Pan and great value brands of peanut butter were recalled last year over reports that 300 people in 39 states had been infected with salmonella. And Dole Fresh Foods pulled thousands of cantaloupes imported from Costa Rica off the market also due to salmonella. Salmonella causes abdominal cramps, diarrhea, dehydration, and vomiting. It usually originates in animal feces and the bacteria can be eliminated when the food is heated properly. Another organism that turns up in the food supply is entirely of human origin, norovirus. It's the name of a group of viruses known for causing stomach flu, often called gastroenteritis. They can't grow outside a human's body, so the only way they get into the food is from people. Norovirus causes vomiting, diarrhea, low-grade fever, head and muscle aches, and tiredness. Sick people shouldn't go to work, and the best way to fight the spread of norovirus is by hand washing and cleaning work areas and implements with bleach. There are many other ways that our food supply can be compromised. The recent controversy over imports from China is an important example. A report in the Washington Post documented how in one four-month period, Federal Food and Drug Administration inspectors refused entry to shipments of food from China a remarkable 298 times. Foods were found with banned antibiotics, cancer-causing chemicals, illegal pesticides, putrefying bacteria, and filth found in Chinese fruits, juices, catfish, dried apples, scallops, and mushrooms. Members of the National Meat Association have a powerful incentive to ensure the safety of the meat supply. The risks of selling anything less than the safest meat are too great. Barry Carpenter is executive director. National Meat Association is an industry association representing meat processors. We represent meat processors from the largest in the world to the very smallest in the United States. And they do a whole array of products from every processed meat item you can imagine to just the raw materials that go into the processors. And what we do is we supply information and technical expertise to address all their needs and all their concerns. Food safety is a top priority of ours. Our members are, are only in business because they produce a safe product. 
There are a number of government agencies which work with all parts of the food chain to ensure the integrity of what we put on our dinner plates. The Agricultural Marketing Service is the USDA's marketing agency. It's known for setting grades and standards. Whenever you buy a steak, you usually look to see if it's prime or choice or select. And so that steak is in there. For chicken, it's grade A. And for eggs, it's grade A as well. And so it's in all those type of products there are. For fruits and vegetables, not so much. People look at the shape, the quality, the defects that are associated with it. And all those, the shape, the defects, et cetera, all have the value in the marketplace that is assigned by AMS graders. It's inspected by AMS graders at both the origin as well as the terminal market. What their work does touches the life of every American every day. AMS plays a role um, with uh, the agricultural industry in ensuring that the, the highest quality and, and, and the most consistent high quality uh, product uh, is, uh, is provided uh, to consumers. Uh, in doing that, AMS plays a facilitating role. Uh, we are, for the most part, not a regulatory agency, uh, but we do things which are supportive to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the movement of product uh, from farm to table. The National School Lunch Program is an important example of how the food supply chain can be managed to ensure safety and food wholesomeness. Since 1946, uh, Congress has determined that there ought to be a National School Lunch Program. And so in order to ensure that needy kids are fed uh, throughout the um, school year, we go in and we work with school districts and we work with the Food and Nutrition Service in order to determine what kind of foods that they might need uh, for, their, for their diet, for their uh, desire uh, in the school lunch program. And so we work uh, year-round ensuring that they are able to obtain the, the, their requests, whether it be chicken nuggets, whether it be fajita strips, whether it be ground beef hamburgers, whether it be uh, canned applesauce. We purchase about $700 million worth of food. Uh, for the National School Lunch Program uh, every year. We buy the best quality ground beef for school kids. Quality and value go hand in hand. And the quality has to meet the needs of our customer. And our customers, we feel, are the school kids. We visit Cherry Meats in Chicago to discover how food safety and food wholesomeness are ensured through every step of the food chain. Cherry Meats is a major supplier to the school lunch program. The company actually started, uh, was started by my grandfather and was during the Depression. He had a, a horse and buggy and he sold meats off the horse and buggy uh, to people uh, on the street. Our products uh, uh, generally are for uh, school systems and for food service use. We make uh, hamburger patties, we make uh, sausage items, and, uh, uh, and we also make products that go uh, for retail use. We demand that we bring in the best product we can get and we've got a great partnership with uh, uh, a couple beef suppliers and we do stay strictly within those companies. In other words, we don't go on the outside and, and try to get the cheapest product we can. We, we customize uh, um, our suppliers uh, into training them what we need. Uh, they make it for us the way we need it and then we just maintain that quality throughout the process. The quality and safety of the meat here does not rely solely on inspection. Dr. John Surak, food safety consultant at Surak Associates in Clemson, South Carolina, says that food safety cannot be inspected into a product. And end product testing is costly, time consuming, and not reliable. All of the inspection of final product usually brings a false sense of security. We don't normally test enough product to be able to make a decision on what is happening with a specific lot. Our inspection systems, which were very good and have always been very good, always focused on product inspection, product control. So the biggest change and that was important to the ground beef program is that we learned to get uh, complying product, it had to come from a process that complied. In other words, you cannot inspect product to comply, it has to be produced to comply. So that's where we're changed now to go to more of a process control. They use supply chain management. Supply chains, of course, are the whole linkage from the beginning of your raw material production through the process to the final delivery to the end customer. The idea of a supply chain management system is you're managing not only the logistics, the flow of the material throughout the system, but also, is the material as it moves from one point to the other the right material in the right condition so the next part of the process can properly handle it? 
supply chain quality management is a very important contributor to providing safe food. If you have your uh, process well known, identified, and under control, you create a situation where you're very, very unlikely to create a contaminated product. Sealed tubs of boneless beef arrive at the Cherry Meats loading dock in refrigerated trucks. The meat comes from a packing house that has been chosen carefully to meet Cherry Meats requirements. In fact, they have built a vendor-customer relationship together to be sure that all meat entering the processing system is always at the standards that Cherry wants for its school lunch customer. It is important that the boneless beef coming into the operation be of acceptable quality. Uh, have uh, and that as it goes through their operation they know what is happening as far as uh, cleanliness uh, and uh, pathogen levels and that they are not introducing any uh, problems and that the final product as it goes into the patty or to the uh, uh, ground coarse ground beef package is uh, of a good quality low pathogens uh, the right level of fats etc the boneless beef is lifted into a grinder. One beef product is coarse ground, which will be turned into one pound and ten pound chubs, ground beef that can be used for any number of food dishes, such as lasagna, meatballs, chili, and meat sauces. More finely ground beef will be made into hamburgers. The main uh, uh, thing that we want to monitor and maintain is temperature. Uh, not only of the product, but the, the uh, coolers that it's stored in, uh, and the time that it's stored in that cooler. Uh, if, we, if we can keep anything 40 degrees or less, uh, we're going to minimize any kind of bacterial growth. We have a lot of long, long time employees. Uh, when we do hire, we do put them through uh, food safety handling instruction. Uh, they're on a, on a uh, for the first week, they are watched very closely to make sure they do follow all the rules and regulations that we've set in addition to meat inspection uh, and AMS. Hair nets, uh, beard nets, um, uh, gloves, sanitary gloves, uh, removing of all garments once they leave a production area, washing their hands when they re-enter, putting new gloves on once they enter. Uh, all this is very, very important. What we try to do is eliminate as much of the handling of the product as we can. Over the years, we've mechanized um, to such an extent where our patty operation, uh, for example, once the patties are formed, they are never touched. They go through the freezing process, the packaging process, the bagging process, the boxing process without ever being touched by human hands. Nobody touching meat with a bare hand. You notice these things. Uh, you would notice the, uh, how, how the people would walk around the plant and that and being very careful and uh, meticulous, even from the extent trying not to breathe on meat. We identify what are the potential hazards in a food product. Then we design control procedures to control those hazards, either by preventing their incorporation into the food product or by eliminating through processing steps. And we, imp we implement those control procedures and we verify that the system is working day in and day out. Both the USDA and the FDA use HACCP standards for food. That means hazard analysis and critical control point. This has been strengthened with the ISO 22000 Food Safety Management System. Those of us who worked on ISO 22000, we made a commitment to revise that standard every five years. And the object is to bring all these new technologies and describe it into a standard so it can be used by food processors like Cherry Meats to improve food safety. We uh, do what's known as an on-site capability assessment, where an auditor will actually come out and, uh, and essentially it's the old uh, saying, do what you say and say what you do. And if you wrote down and saying you're going to do everything, we merely check out to make sure you actually do it. Throughout, the temperature is steadily lowered, starting at about 40 degrees, refrigeration temperature, to 28 degrees, just below freezing. The chilling helps to form better hamburgers and reduces microbial growth. The patties are machine formed while the temperature keeps dropping to around zero degrees. Once the patties are formed, they are conveyed through liquid nitrogen that's a frigid 200 degrees below zero. Our patty line actually goes through a freeze tunnel, we call it. Uh, it's on a conveyor system and it's in that tunnel for approximately seven minutes. And all it is is a conveyor belt that goes around and around and around and up. 
and the patties go in at the lower level as it's going up the seven minutes it finally comes out the top frozen at zero degrees and liquid nitrogen is showering over all of these patties as they're going and fans are blowing on the inside to create a wind chill factor. When they come out the other end they are zero degrees and they go through the bagging process and then go directly into our freezer which runs at 20 below. The goal through this entire process from the moment the meat has been ground is to lower the temperature to zero degrees Fahrenheit or lower and to keep it that low until it hits the grill in the kitchen of your local school cafeteria. Also, at various steps through the process, samples are taken into the lab to be tested for fat content and other factors so that adjustments to the process can be made right away. This data is entered on control charts so the manufacturer and the USDA can quickly spot variances from ideal standards and quickly make corrections if necessary. The main tools that we use now are uh, SPC tools, statistical process controls. And what we do is we try to take all that data that we collect throughout the day, whether it's for metal detection, uh, portion size, uh, uh, mi microbial counts, and what we do is try to take all that data and put it into some type of statistical data base, which we would now we use Northwest Analytical, uh, to chart things. And, and we can, by looking at those charts, we can see how things are trending, how if, if if something is starting to get out of control, we can take steps to prevent it from really getting out of control. Now, if we look at the control chart, uh, and with what we see on this control chart is on the far left side, we see a bunch of stars. Those are signals. That means the process is not stable. And the company, the manufacturer, must look for those, those causes, those problems, and then eliminate those causes. A histogram accompanies each lot of meat so anyone can look at a record of the meat as it moves through the supply chain. We measure the critical parameters that are needed. From a quality standpoint, that is a percent fat. We have to hit a target. We also do measurements on food safety issues. So we measure microbiological measures such as E. coli. They are indicators of the potential of having pathogens. We also do pathogen testing. We're responsible for everything. No longer can we say, well, uh, we're doing it this way because you told us to do it this way. Our product isn't accepted because your inspector said it's accepted or your grader put a stamp on that box and said accepted as specified. None of that happens anymore. Our logo goes on that box. Our, our establishment number goes on that box. And once that's on there, we are responsible for it all the way through. One of the very important uh, I think results that come out of this uh, ag marketing service example with the National School Lunch Program is it so clearly demonstrates that taking a, a process management approach, you know, using SPC to analyze what's happening every way, the good record keeping, the good logistics, transport, that you can produce a food supply chain that you have in tremendous faith in is producing very safe product and product that is very wholesome, meets the nutritional requirements of the end customer. I mean, this is the way to get this job done. The food chain involves so many variables and such a large volume of material moving through the system that sometimes things go wrong. People forget to wash their hands. A fragment of salmonella or E. coli slips through. Sometimes food can make people sick. And yet, the incidence of foodborne illness is minute compared to the quantity of food that is delivered to customers. We have to make it very clear to political leaders that this is our highest priority. The safety and health of our population is our highest priority. So there could be no deviation from the standards. But we also have to bring the science to bear. The science has changed. Heat levels, the handling of food, the kinds of diseases we're dealing with. And once there is an outbreak, we have to have total transparency. We have to get to parents and to families right away, tell them what we know. And uh, both doctors and public health officials have to be able to get the information to test it so that they can be transparent in their conversations with the American people. That's the only way in which the public health uh, has any kind of credibility.
Consumers should know that even at a time where it seems there are a lot of hazards in food and the food system, that there are some things they can do, and particularly if there are young children or elderly parents in the home, these microbiological hazards in food, these foodborne illnesses, can be somewhat controlled through safe practice of proper cooking, proper hand hygiene, avoiding contaminating raw meats, seafood, and fish uh, with ready-to-eat other raw food. The successes of the food supply chain are due to the use of modern standards and procedures managed through the use of statistical process control and supply chain management. Remember, food safety in this country is fragmented. Um, the FDA does fish, um, and the Food and Drug uh, and the uh, Department of Agriculture does meat. So, um, uh, so the responsibilities are split. It means that both agencies have to work together. The Centers for Disease Control is in the same agency as the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, local public health authorities are under the jurisdiction of their states. So it's a fragmented system that needs to work seamlessly together. The agencies and industry do everything they can to try to bring safe food to the marketplace, but the consumer has a lot within their control, particularly as regards microbiological hazards in food. We urge consumers to follow four simple lessons, clean, separate, cook, and chill. We can deal with everything related to food safety now. All we need is educating people and people to do what they're educated to do. We have laws in place, we have processes in place, and we don't need to have any more scientific breakthroughs in order for us to have safe food. Syngenta has provided funding for this program. Syngenta, committed to sustainable agriculture, committed to improving life. Ecolab is the global leader in cleaning, sanitizing, food safety, and infection control. Headquartered in St. Paul, we've been helping to make the world a cleaner, safer, healthier place for more than 80 years. Ag InfoLink, providing the food industry with traceability solutions to enhance business performance, ensure regulatory compliance, and improve food security. For more information, please visit aginfolink.com.